The Therapeutic Goods Administration is currently assessing the classification of MDMA and psilocybin, the component commonly found in magic mushrooms. A reclassification would allow psychiatrists to legally prescribe these drugs for the treatment of mental illness. But more research may be required before they become regulated. To discuss this further, I'm joined by Dr. Stephen Bright, Senior Lecturer of Addiction at ECU. Good morning, Stephen. Good morning. Thanks so much for joining us today. To kick us off, can you uh, round us off how are MDMA and psilocybin currently classified? So these drugs are currently classified as prohibited substances and the rescheduling of them, uh, like we saw with cannabis in 2016, would mean that people authorised, such as psychiatrists, would be able to prescribe these drugs as medicines. And where along the lines are we of the reclassification uh, to become medicinally prescribed? I think the application was made prematurely. So there is good preliminary evidence emerging from overseas that MDMA specifically is a good adjunct in psychotherapy to the treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder. And there's phase three clinical trials currently underway. Similarly, psilocybin and depression Phase three clinical trials currently underway. We're doing research in Australia that's just sort of starting up. We're catching up with the rest of the world when it comes to doing research on these drugs. But I believe it was made prematurely because just like, say, with the vaccines that we're seeing being approved around the world, the phase three trials need to be completed before you put the application into the TGA. So unfortunately, I think I don't think the TGA is going to rule on the rescheduling to allow psychiatrists to prescribe these because the research hasn't been completed yet. Okay, very interesting. You touched on it just before. How are these drugs being medicinally used around the world currently? So around the world, they are still considered prohibited drugs, but in most countries, including Australia, there are ways of doing research with these drugs that allows researchers to administer them to participants or patients for various clinical purposes and so worldwide there's been an international psychedelic science renaissance with sort of basic science research trying to understand how these drugs work in the brain and also clinical research looking at the treatment of mental illness using these drugs and just on that I think the important the, the important thing here is unlike something like medical cannabis where people uh, prescribe something that they then self-administer at home, these drugs would never be used that way. So the way in which the clinical trials are being conducted means that it's part of, say, an 18-week course of psychotherapy in which there might be three drug days where the person spends six to eight hours um, under the influence of the drug with two psychotherapists, the male and female team, who support the patient or the participant through that process. A very different process to what many would be assuming is a prescribed drug as you would take home and administer yourself. It sounds like there's a fairly uh, regulated method that we that would be put into action. Have MDMA and psilocybin moving forward though, has MDMA and psilocybin been used historically to treat uh, mental illness? Yes, it has actually. So with, with psilocybin and probably more... Uh, people would be more aware of LSD. They were banned in the US in the late 60s internationally in 1971. Prior to them being banned, there was a lot of research underway looking at their potential capacity in the treatment of mental illness. Unfortunately, it was shut down due to it sort of escaping the laboratory, if you like, and, you know, recreational use taking off. And there was much concern about the counterculture movement and the association of these drugs with that movement. And so they were banned. And in turn, that really led to the cessation of all research up until the past decade where we've seen this renaissance, this re-emergence of research. And similarly, with MDMA, well before it was a, a, a party drug, it was being used in psychotherapy primarily to treat post-traumatic stress disorder and also in couples counselling and relationship counselling. I think people that had received it in that context, you know, got wind of the, the idea that it, it might have recreational utility and in the early 80s it took off as a party drug in the US and again with concern around recreational use, it was banned in the US and Australia followed suit in 1986.
You touched on MDMA being uh, medicinally used in uh, couples therapy as well as being used in PTSD. If it was picked up and reclassified today, how else would it be used? I think it would be difficult to use it outside of post-traumatic stress disorder at the moment because that's really where the research is. There wasn't much, unfortunately, there wasn't much research done in the early 80s prior to MDMA being banned. So I think at the moment it would be primarily used for that if it were to be reclassified. However, there is research underway at the moment looking at MDMA in the treatment of anxiety, social anxiety associated with people who have autistic spectrum disorder. And it's also being looked at in treating PTSD, not just with the patient, but going back to that idea of relationship counselling in what's called conjoint um, behavioural treatment. So it involves the cup. So there is a lot of promising research that extends what we already know uh, MDMA was being used for in the past and is gathering evidence to demonstrate that it might have some efficacy in these particular areas, but there still needs to be a, a lot more research done before we've got enough data to demonstrate that these are safe and effective treatments. So a rather a relatively small uh, group of people uh, would be offered these drugs um, for help. Is there any concern over the accessibility of reclassified drugs such as MDMA and psilocybin in the community? I have a couple of concerns about this application going in prematurely. One is we don't have enough psychiatrists and psychotherapists trained in administering this particular treatment. So myself and a colleague underwent some training in 2018, but there's very few people in Australia that are trained to do it at the moment, which is going to limit accessibility. In addition to that, it would at the moment be a very expensive enterprise to be able to provide this therapy. So, you know, participants in research that I'm involved in receive this treatment for free. If patients were to receive it outside of treatment, I estimate that it might cost a, a patient $20,000 to access a course of treatment by the time you take into account the cost of pharmaceutical grade MDMA, the cost of two psychotherapists plus a psychiatrist. It is very expensive and so that is one of my major concerns is that this lack of access should MDMA and psilocybin be reclassified could mean that people try to sort of you know, do it yourself at home with use accessing um, you know unregulated uh, illicit MDMA and, and psilocybin, or accessing it through the underground in which people are already providing these therapies. I think one of the problems that we've got is people with severe mental illness that isn't responding to treatment are desperate to find a solution, and I think people have become a little impatient with the, the research getting to a point so that these things can be made available. So there is already evidence of underground MDMA-assisted psychotherapy and underground mushroom-assisted psychotherapy. And so I am a little concerned that if we were to reschedule it, even though it, on one hand it would increase access because psychiatrists would be able to legally prescribe it, I do worry that the limited access and the increased awareness could lead to people accessing it through this underground mechanism and of course that's not a safe way of accessing it because there's no regulation and quality control over the people providing the therapy. You can't report your underground psychotherapist to a registration body and with things like MDMA you just don't know whether the drug that you're getting is MDMA. Yeah absolutely so uh, just to touch on what you were saying if this was to be reclassified and became more popularized as uh, a good medicinal product, it might actually increase the popularity of the unregulated side of the drug and people might, uh, as you were saying, uh, do it underground with their own um, 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 psychiatric processes. Yeah, and I think the way around that is to ensure that when we move forward with this process I mean, in collaboration with the TGA, that we do so by embedding it within the Medicare system, ensuring that the drug is available on the PDS. Australia has a fantastic public health care service, and I think if we can integrate it within the public health care service we have, then it will make sure that it's accessible and it will limit some of those concerns that have raised around people accessing it through you know, unregulated means. And so... 
Um, all of the research that's happening in Australia is being done in conjunction with hospitals so that we can look at integrating it into our public health care system and make sure that when it is made uh, available for psychiatrists to prescribe outside of a research context that it's done so within our public health care system and people are able to access it. Okay, so you can definitely see it becoming a regulated drug in the um, psychiatry um, realm. How do you see the drug being reclassified over the next five years or so? Well, I would say within five years we will see it rescheduled as a Schedule A uh, medicine, which would allow psychiatrists to prescribe it. I think what will be required between now and then is accredited training programs that are provided in conjunction with the Royal Australian New Zealand College of Psychiatry, the Australian Psychological Society. Um, we need to get on board all of the various key stakeholders in this so that people are only able to provide the therapy who are, have undergone the training and are accredited to provide the treatment. I mean, psilocybin itself, for example, is not particularly dangerous as a drug in terms of its physical toxicity, but it can certainly create very intense psychological experiences. And you want to make sure that the people that are providing those therapies have the right training so that they're able to assist people and, and, and minimise the potential of any psychological damage occurring. Absolutely. It definitely sounds like the right way forward. Thanks so much for talking with us today and uh, best of luck in your future research. Thanks for having me.